Uh, I will uh, sort of continue from uh, where Thorsten uh, left us. Uh, I want to talk about the quantum foundations of uh, spin chemistry in general, including uh, the Avian compass mechanism. And at the end, uh, I want to go through a new direction we have, uh, which we think is very exciting. Paul Brumer is also talking about that. Uh, uh, we call it quantum vision. Um, so again, the radical pair mechanism, uh, you have a donor acceptor diet, uh, it's photo excited, and then you have the creation of a radical pair. Uh, there is spin coherence between a singlet radical pair and the triplet radical pair, and this spin coherence uh, does not survive forever because you have an incoherent process of recombination that is state selective. There are two different recombining channels for singlet and triplet. To come back to your question, you, you don't only have coherence inside here, you have serious entanglement between uh, spins, uh, nuclear spins, electron spins, and you have all sorts of coherences. Uh, now, uh, this is a typical example of a radical pair. Fundamentally, uh, it is about a multi-spin system consisting of two electron spins, one for each radical, and a number of nuclear spins uh, contained in each one of those two molecules. So uh, this multi-spin system is in general described by a density matrix uh, rho as all quantum systems. And our work, uh, or mo most of our work, has centered at, at the question of how does this density matrix evolve in time? What is the law of time evolution of the quantum state of this multi-spin system? Now, this is foundational for the whole field of spin chemistry why? Because obviously all observables, uh, reaction yields, reaction rates, EPR, NMR observable uh, calculations on the Avian compass uh, rest on the time evolved quantum state of the spin system. Now this time uh, evolution uh, is complicated. It's not only unitary because of the magnetic interactions within the molecules, but because radical pairs is an open system, it has uh, also another term describing the open quantum dynamics of, of, of the system. And so our uh, focus has been, what is this term? Yeah. Since the beginning of uh, the field in, in, in the 60s uh, and until recently, uh, the field of ke spin chemistry has used uh, an equation postulated by a German physical, th theoretical physical chemist, Haberkorn. It's called Haberkorn equation. So it has uh, the unitary part, of course, and then there, there is the, the open system description involving projection operators and two rates, Ks and Kt, that are the recombination rates. Now, uh, we have applied the theory of open quantum systems and uh, revealed the role played by the vibrational reservoir because the radical ion pair sits up here in energy scale, but the neutral products sit down here. And to, to go to them, there is a vibrational uh, reservoir and that has two roles, actually. One accounts for the leaky character of the radical pair, that is, all radical pair pairs react away and produce products at the end, either singlet or triplet. But we have shown that this same reservoir can produce decoherence uh, by virtual jumps transition from radical pair to the reservoir and back. And essentially, we introduced uh, the understanding of coherence in the system by, by introducing decoherence. Uh, uh, we also had to introduce a quantifier of singlet triplet coherence. There are three triplet states, so there are three kinds of coherences between the singlet and all three triplets. Here is a formula, uh, it doesn't matter how it looks, I don't want to go into math, but anyhow, this, this quantifier, it's a parameter between uh, zero and one, like in uh, light coherence, you know, and it one means it's maximally coherent, zero means it's maximally incoherent, and in between uh, the system is partially coherent. So uh, after a lot of uh, math, etc., again, I don't want to go through the equations. We have a master equation describing the fundamental quantum dynamics of the system. It contains the generator of coherence, again, the Hamiltonian interactions, a dissipator of coherence, which is intrinsic to the system, cannot get rid of. Uh, terms accounting for population loss in the two channels. And uh, if, you, if you have additional relaxation mechanisms, that in almost all cases there are, another term for account, account, accounting for those. Now, uh, interestingly, if we force our coherence quantifier to be zero for all times, we retrieve Haberkorn's master equation. 
that means that the old theory accounts for basically incoherent dynamics. Uh, however, it is okay, the old theory is okay if there is additional spin relaxation with a, relative, uh, with a relevant time constant that is much smaller than the reaction time. In that case, the old theory is fine. In the other uh, extreme, when, when uh, additional spin relaxation has a time constant longer than the reaction time, the old theory is highly problematic. Now, is there such a case? Yes. Uh, before going to that, we have tested the theory by uh, comparing with data that was done in the first paper in 2009. Uh, this is uh, Oxford data, and this is the reproduction of it. However, uh, the direct comparison uh, with data has been tactically a secondary line of attack. Why? Because the discussion can be diverted into discussing whether we understand the, the Hamiltonian couplings that enter the Hamiltonian. But we, we don't care about that. We care about the form of the open system dynamics uh, in the second term. So we have uh, we had to find a different strategy and that was, okay, let's test the internal consistency of each theory, the old and the new, on its own. And we have done so with two ways, looking at quantum trajectories and then looking at the violation of entropy bounds. Now, quickly, uh, the first, is relevant to photosynthesis because uh, people study the structure of photosynthetic reaction centers. Why? Because radical pairs, radical pair reactions are involved in the reaction center and they produce a, a high non-equilibrium nuclear spin polarization. So people put the reaction centers in an NMR magnet, li light them up and, uh, and get, get nice NMR spectra. Now from those, they extract information about, about the molecular structure of, of the reaction center. Now here, the reaction time is too fast for spin relaxation to set in. So that's an ideal uh, test bed to understand radical pair dynamics. Uh, we have done so theoretically analyzing the single molecule evolution. We can write down single molecule quantum trajectories, how, how the quantum evolution should look or would look for a single radical pair. Now, we can average many of those and get an average of, of many quantum trajectories and compare with our master equation, the black line, the, sh the, the two should coincide. Uh, we have done the same thing from, for the old theory and, and there is a, a, a severe discrepancy in the, in the comparison. Has, has there is lack of consistency in, in, the, in the old theory between a single molecule description and ensemble description. Uh, the, that, that creates a problem because uh, KIDNAP experiments, KIDNAP is chemically induced dynamic nuclear polarization, aim at useful molecular structure info which is hiding in the Hamiltonian here. However, the data have convoluted inside them the whole law of evolution of the density matrix. So to extract what you want, you need to deconvolve from the data the, the law of evolution. If, if, if that's uh, not okay, you, then you have a problem. Uh, how big is the problem? We, we simulate a simple experiment, and here on the y-axis is the observable, the kidnap nuclear spin enhancement, and on, on the x-axis is what you're looking for, a uh, hyperfine coupling, for example. Okay? Uh, so if I measure one, I go to the right and see where I hit Habercon's theory. It, I hit it at alpha equals 15, whereas in our theory, alpha is six. So you can have 300% discrepancies in extracting uh, the data you want to extract, or the couplings you want to extract from the experimental data. Uh, a, a different way to show the inconsistency uh, of the old theory at the fundamental level has been uh, entropy. Uh, and we have used an Ozawa entropy bound that says basically if you have a quantum state and do a measurement, uh, the final entropy uh, given by weighted sum of the entropies of the post-measurement states should be smaller than the initial entropy. Beca why? Because you learn, by doing a measurement, you learn something. That's, that's the purpose of the measurement. Hence, the final entropy should be smaller than the initial entropy. And that's general bound that we studied uh, for radical pair dynamics and um, Habercon's theory heavily, severely violates the bound. The black line is final entropy. It should be lower than the red line, which is not. And in our case, again, the bound is uh, satisfied. So these two ways uh, are independent uh, theoretical approaches, testing the consistency of each theory on its own. 
uh, as a more recent work, kind of independent from, from the previous, uh, is uh, to study, to use quantum metrology, in particular fissure information and reaction control, and study the fundamental magnetic sensitivity limits of this reaction using a quantum circuit. Uh, so, you know, attempting to connect quantum metrology tools with biochemical spin-dependent reaction. Um, so, uh, since the early work of uh, Klaus Schulten, uh, people have known that uh, there is quantum coherence prevalent in, in, this, in this reaction. We have extended that and shown uh, quantitatively, technically, uh, that we also have quantum measurement dynamics as a byproduct. We have the quantum Zeno effect. That's a byproduct of uh, the first point. Of course, we introduced decoherence. Uh, and quantum coherence quantifiers use the theory of quantum retrodiction to account for the reaction terms. Entropy, quantum information entropy, and uh, most recently, uh, quantum metrology. So that I think that makes for a good paradigm of, of quantum biology. Now, uh, we also want to explore quantum biology in different fronts, uh, although there is tons of work to do in, in, in spin chemistry. Uh, we'd like to expand and explore uh, in a different front. So we, we want to synthesize quantum optics with uh, the physiology of human vision. And there are a number of ways we are approaching this. Uh, I can have only time to show you one uh, applied direction uh, relevant to biometric identification. You know that uh, there are various technologies currently uh, used for uh, identifying people. Most advanced is iris scan and perhaps face recognition. The, the problem with all those technologies is that they, they don't quantify the security. Uh, there's no number. Uh, and they can be foiled by somebody who has the time and money to, to do so. Uh, so their security is just relying on hope. So uh, we try to alleviate these problems. Uh, inspired by an early paper in 1942, uh, Energy, Quanta, and Vision, these authors uh, demonstrated the single photon or few photon sensitivity of our visual system. So uh, they showed that the probability to see very weak light depends on the, photon, on the number of photons incident on our uh, eye or retina. Uh, and uh, fo Poissonian photon statistics are involved to, to really generate this curve. Of course, when you shine uh, 100 photons on one's eye, not all arrive at the retina. Why? Because there are optical losses. And these are quantified by parameter alpha. Now, these three authors did this experiment with themselves. And each one of them had a different uh, alpha parameter, parameter. However, all three uh, traces could be combined in one, having a common uh, threshold, k equals 6, describing the visual uh, system detection threshold. So they claim that we need uh, uh, to detect at the retina at least six photons, k photons, uh, or higher in order to have the visual perception. So uh, they wanted to demonstrate uh, visual sensitivity. We said, OK, we know that now. We know that our visual system is sensitive to a few photons. But let's use this alpha parameter, parameter which is subject dependent, to identify people. So to do the sort of the, the opposite way around. So our uh, proposal has been to measure uh, or classify basically this parameter, shine n photons on one's eye. A fraction of them is detected. If this fraction is higher than the threshold, we see. If it's lower than the threshold, we don't see. And this alpha parameter appears to be uh, subject dependent. Uh, and um, it can lead to an unprecedented and quantifiable security, that is, uh, somebody claiming, uh, false claiming to be somebody else, cannot pass the test or will pass with a very small probability of 10 to the minus 10, for example. And uh, the trick to, to do that is once, once you have measured uh, the map of visual, uh, the map of optical losses of one's eye that would take some time in the beginning, then you can very quickly infer in, in, in a few seconds, infer whether this person is the, the one who claiming uh, to be by uh, shining uh, uh, photons in uh, spots where there is 
big uh, sensitivity in such a way that there is some pattern and then shining many other, uh, illuminating many other spots where the subject has a low sensitivity, so the chances are that they will not perceive there any light, so the real person will manage at the end to, to respond to a specific optical pattern, whereas an imposter would observe noise and wouldn't be able to, uh, to correctly reply. So that's uh, uh, basically an unbreakable fingerprint involving uh, both the eye, the retina, and the brain, because you're talking about uh, perception. Uh, the, the idea and the analysis of this method were published last year. We are now uh, undergo technology development, and uh, hopefully in the beginning of 2019, we can do the first human tests uh, with our students uh, in the beginning, and uh, ourselves uh, at the end. <laughs> uh, now, uh, uh, there, was a, there was a workshop in 2004 about whether w uh, quantum effects in biology are trivial or not. So Wiseman, uh, a quantum physicist, said that a better definition of what is non-trivial is not what will surprise physicists, but rather what would convince biologists that they need to learn quantum physics. <laughs> uh, we are, I don't think we are there yet, but I think and strongly you know, feel that we are uh, somewhere right here, and there is all this quantum biology uh, iceberg uh, uh, in, in the bottom. So thanks. Yes. So questions about the iceberg. The uh, I, into the microphone, please. You can have this one for the time. Thank you. So I have two questions. The first one is I thought that Paul Quiet reported two years ago that humans can see a single photon. Mm. I mean, it was in Nature, in nature paper. No, no, there was a group of, uh, uh, from uh, Ali Pasov Aziri at Rockefeller who reported uh, No, this was that. Paul Quiat from U no, Urbana. No, 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 no. Paul Quiat uh, uh, wrote something against this claim, uh, actually claiming that the statistical analysis of that paper I see. was, was I, Because uh, I, I was, was okay. flawed, yeah. So it, is it flawed or not? Sorry? Is it flawed or not? We don't know. We, oh, we don't know. Yeah. Okay. So the second question that I have is, so uh, first of all, I want to apologize that I'm talking so, so much, but I've been working on this in this field for two hours, so I have a lot of questions. Um, so how do these birds avoid the noise from the environment in terms of visual perception? I mean, at the end of the day, this signal has to propagate to the visual cortex has to be processed, then it has to go to the motor cortex, and that bird has to start flipping its uh, wings in certain direction, right? So we can't avoid the fact that it's bombarded while it's flying, bombarded by visual information coming from, you know, just from the environment. So I just don't understand how does it propagate this small signal? Yep. Uh, on okay. In, in, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm <laughs> Uh, that's a question to ask to the biologist. So has uh, anyone Thurston, Thurston, Thurston uh, was, uh, uh, is let, let me just uh, continue my question because it's oh. not going Could it be direction. quick as uh, uh, we're running out of time? Yeah, sure. Well, we have time. Don't worry about it. <laughs> uh, so uh, has anyone put actually an a, a EEG on the head of this bird and see if actually there is change in the EEG? Okay. There you go. Um, Ros Peter. Not an EG, but uh, we don't really exactly know how exact the magnetic compass is. Some behavioral studies suggest that they can um, dif uh, distinguish an inclination of uh, 100 and, uh, uh, no, of uh, 85 uh, degrees from 90 degrees, which would make an accuracy of about 5 degrees. And there is a similar thing now for the horizontal. But... Uh, for the birds, that is probably not the problem, because when they fly outside, they use optical um, yeah, targets as, uh, to, as to be helpful to keep the direction, as we also would do when we walk with the magnetic mm -hmm. compass. Mm -hmm. So since Krustan said we have time, let me <laughs> just answer real quick to him. Um, EEG on birds is very difficult because the retina is, is just, it gets into shock when you touch anything for a lot of time and you lose sort of, so, so it's very difficult to do it. Um, there is example of where you have uh, 
similar inputs that come through the visual system, but are then uh, leading to different representation. For example, in the um, the snakes that detect infrared. You have a very similar thing. So there's an example of how this could work, that you actually have something that goes through the visual system but leads to a separate representation. So that's not a fundamental problem, I think, on the neuronal representation. We spent um, sort of theorizing about 15 years back, like different ways of how one could separate, you know, the visual from the magnetic, you know, information. And there's, there's a bunch of things that, that it could be. One of them is that, you know, the visual patterns are usually much more high frequency in the... Um, uh, in, in the, uh, you know, the, the, the space domain. So you could imagine that you could filter that out. You could also imagine that turning the head, you get uh, different speeds of the magnetic turn, of the magnetic flow and the visual flow, and you could actually use that to separate the two. So there's multiple ways one could do this, but the, the, the measurements, unfortunately, could not be done um, because of these issues. Thank you. We've got to move on to other questions as well, or, or <laughs> responses at least. Alexandra had her hand up first. On the issue of uh, Lipa Shabasiri's uh, experiments and the challenge that Paul might have put. So it's, it's all in the archive, and they actually retract the challenge because the referees challenged the challenge. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it was scientific mm -hmm. flow or, or, or inconsistent. So, mm -hmm. so far, that's the first great determination that humans can't see one photon. Thank you, Alexandra. And you want just a comment on, on Thornton. I, I like your answer, but I think that's a quantitative, not a qualitative question, because you have very strong optical signals with a very weak magnetic signal, right? So in a sense, is do we can the system actually resolve that? It's not just the representation; it's just on the on, on the measurement before. And I think you have been thinking about it, uh, but like I said, I don't think that's a qualitative. That's a real quantitative question: if the systems can do that or not. Well, surely in, in other systems, I mean, in, in sound, for instance, we can hear our, our, our name being called in a room full of noise. Our brains are really good at filtering out noise and identifying mm -hmm. signals. Uh, we know that ourselves. The visual system is great for picking out signals mm -hmm. from uh, noise. So brains seem to be pretty good at doing that, I would have thought. Can we move on to another question, if, uh, mm -hmm. if I may? If, uh so, uh, my question is about your pattern uh, identification uh, mm. so uh, how long does would it take to actually characterize a person's retina and then yeah. in terms of uh, identification how many measurements do you need yeah it would how many it challenge response right in, in in the beginning it would be like a visual exam it would take like 20 minutes but after you've done that and register the the, uh, the map of your visual sensitivity it would take a couple of questions uh, depending on what pr rejection probability you like for the bad guy uh, so it would take, you know, 10 seconds or something. Uh, just a brief question. How constant is this? I mean, did you test the same person, let's say, today yeah, and a year yeah, later yeah, that's or so? That's known from the medical community that that might change, but we don't really, uh, we are not very sensitive on that. So. Um, any one last quick question? Or mm. are we going to go for coffee then, I think? <laughs> <laughs>